Okie dokie. So uh, this week, we're going to talk about texturing. Last week, we spent some time really focusing on the construction practices uh, for our little house. And this week, I want to kind of slow down a little bit and talk about some presentation ideas and some texturing and some lighting, uh, lighting effects and lighting considerations that we should really look to incorporate so that we're generating a really pretty picture. Because remember, we're fundamentally in the business of 2D, not 3D. At the end of the day, we're still creating a photograph. The model, believe it or not, is just kind of half of it. So we need to spend some time looking at some presentation ideas on how to craft some pretty pictures. And we'll, talk, we'll, we'll sprinkle in some modeling goodness along the way as, as well. Let me turn off some lights here. All right. So this is my house. Okay. It's not my actual house, although I would love to live in a house that looks like this, right? But this is the house that I made, right? Uh, I wanted to kind of showcase my thinking in this, because whenever you're creating a model, oftentimes the process that we go through determines the outcome, right? Uh, our tool set is incredibly complex. There's a lot of steps. Uh, the tools are kind of abstract. You know, there's no make me a house button, right? So we got to take these weird tools and put them into a kind of a big melting pot of our process. And then, poof, hopefully we'll push out something that kind of looks like a house. So I try to keep my process as organic as I can, or as long as I can. I don't want to commit until I'm really pleased with the overall design. And I wanted to showcase kind of my thinking behind how I do most of my modeling, especially when I'm creating something that's unseen, something that's not coming directly from reference, right? Nine times out of 10, you're not going to get a blueprint, right? So we have to take some basic visual cues from a lot of other different things. And here's my little house. As with all things 3D modeling, it began simply with some reference, OK? I practice what I preach. This is the reference image that I found on the Googs, OK? I was like, yeah, that'd be a cool place to begin, right? It's a cool looking house. Um, however, once we start looking at the reference or the the portions of this reference image, you'll quickly find that this is uh, a really great collection of reference images, but they're a bad collection of reference images that we can use as a backdrop item over in Moto, right? We can't model from these images, right? But we can still incorporate them as part of our process. All of these images are perspective photographs. Very clearly, this is some uh, model for maybe some tabletop game, okay, or a miniature for a tabletop game. And someone's taken some photographs of both maybe their sculpture and their paint job, which is awesome, by the way. I wish I knew who actually created this, uh, this model, because it's a good, a good model from a tabletop game. Okay? Uh, but all of, these, all of these, uh, um, these images are perspective images. We don't have one that's perfectly from the front or perfectly from the side or from the top. These two here in the middle kind of get us in the ballpark. But whenever you start to incor incorporate an actual photograph, you're always going to be battling against the inherent perspective, excuse me, the inherent distortion that a lens is going to create, right? Thing, uh, the straight lines in a photograph are always going to bend and warp towards the vantage point inside the scene, right? We can't avoid that when it comes to photography, OK? We can minimize it, but they're always going to be a part of the image itself. And we can see that alive and kicking on these images here. Shoot, look at the, the top right-hand corner image. You can very clearly see the roof line. And it runs as a diagonal image towards, or a diagonal line towards the back of the image. That's not going to work for us in Moto as a backdrop item. But we still can use them as a part of our, our uh, modeling process. I have two computer monitors at home. And uh, when I'm modeling at home, I have all my reference on one monitor and Moto or Maya or whatever I'm using on the other monitor. And I'm constantly looking at Moto looking at my reference, looking at Modo, looking at my reference, OK? It's a good, good part, or it's a good, good workflow to kind of increase our efficiency. All right. So as I'm starting to build this, I want to show you some ideas here. Of course, here's the uh, where I am now. I'm actually going in and modeling in, as one might imagine, all the little boards and what have you. I'm not quite finished yet, but I'm getting there. It's starting to look pretty good, OK? huh? What basic simple shape is a board? Rectangle. It's a rectangle. That's all it is. That's why I started with a whole bunch of rectangles. And if you look very carefully, all I've done here, this is not magic, right? All I've done here on this one particular one is I've sliced it. And then I'm going in and kind of stretching out those edges to create kind of a you know, non-uniform shape and size in all the boards, right? Just kind of break up the shape a little bit. 
I don't remember what I did at the I probably cloned it. Just did a clone, like a whole bunch of a whole bunch of them. And then I started going in and customizing each one to make it unique. Okay. So this is the direction that I'm going, but I want to show you where I began. And it all begins with a layout mesh. Okay. So here's my layout mesh. Okay. Now with this with these very simple pieces of geometry, ultimately what am I trying to capture here? Yeah, the general size, shape, and proportion of the major pieces. I'm not trying to go in and add every single board at this level of detail. I'm exploring. I'm trying to figure out what this shape looks like in three dimensions. Looking at a picture and drawing something in 2D is one thing, but actually building it in 3D and, and, and populating a volume with polygons is something completely different. We don't really know what our shape's going to be until we start putting it in some sort of three-dimensional environment and seeing how this surface here or that surface there relates to the size and the angle of another surface, okay? We want to provide ourselves with an opportunity to explore, right? Because we don't really know until we get in there, okay? Remember, we are artists here, okay? We've got our little digital ball of clay in front of, in front of us. We need to spend some time just looking at plane, the shapes, the volume, how big the roof is in comparison to this thing over there. Hopefully, and I remember when I did this, this took me off about five minutes to make, right? What basic simple shapes am I using here? Yeah, that's a whole bunch of cubes, right? Just, there's a whole bunch of cubes very sloppily constructed together, right? I'm not trying to make a perfect model. I know that in this stage of my construction practice, I'm just trying to get something down, right? This is kind of like a thumbnail sketch, if you will, of the overall shape. Very little is connected to each other. I mean, they're all a whole bunch of, you know, these are not placed very well, okay? I'm just trying to figure out how big do these support beams need to be in order for the audience to read them as a support beam, okay? Because uh, remember, we're in the business of 2D, and this also gives me an excellent, excellent opportunity to throw it in camera, right? To physically create a render and to see what this looks like at its most simple rudimentary stage. I just opened up the preview render window, hit the play button, and this is what I have. This is a, I, oh, I, I need to get it in a lens, right, in a camera lens to see if it's working. Because at the end of the day, it's what the camera takes a picture of that's the most important part. If a certain detail is too small, then it's too small, right? We need to make it bigger. We need to know that pretty early on in our process, right? Okay. So I try to get it over here as fast as I possibly can, just so I can under start, start to understand the role and the importance of all of these different, uh, all these different shapes and volumes that I've created. Then once I'm happy, and this is really like five or 10 minutes worth of work, okay? Some very simple shapes. I mean, shoot, look at my roof line here. I don't care that that's wrong, okay? The envelope kind of collapses in on itself at the top. I don't care at this stage. I'm just looking and exploring the shapes. Because eventually, I'm going to come back and make a good model. This is also not. Uh, this is also a guide. It's not a blueprint. So when I start making the actual next stage of things, I start to make some uh, some discoveries along the way. And I remember very directly from the reference that you know there was an overhang here. In order to get some good arches, I had to push some things out and change my battle plan. Okay, this is an organic process, right? This is not a linear sequence that we're stepping through to the end result. The really great thing about our tool set and this workflow is that it allows for our own kind of uh, discovery of the shapes. We can make changes, okay? And we should make changes to our models because that fundamentally tells us that we're looking at what we're making and that's good artistry, okay? All right. Now, I'm not going to go through about, uh, uh, go through how I made every single last one of these bits and pieces. For the most part, it just really is simple construction practices. There's nothing too fancy about it. Uh, I know there's the, that there's a, a tremendous amount of detail infused in the mesh itself, uh, but they're all very simple shapes. One other suggestion that I would make as you continue to go through your own kind of experience and journey in, in, in learning how to be good 3D modelers, turn off your wireframes from time to time. Your wireframes create an optical illusion that will potentially kind of create bad decisions, okay? It'll give you a false read, if you will, on what you're actually seeing. Because sometimes you just need to look at what the polygons create and not so much the wireframes. So I get in the habit pretty early on 
of just turning off my wireframes and then looking, okay? Just looking at what I have and seeing if it's working. I'm a big believer that if uh, I can read the shapes and read the volumes without the wireframes, I'm there, okay? I'm probably in the ballpark of what I need uh, for the render to be successful, okay? If I'm relying exclusively on the wireframes to understand a detail, that detail is probably too small and it's not going to be seen in the render anyways, okay? So turn off the wireframes every once in a while. You can easily activate and deactivate the visibility of your wireframes in your viewport properties. So if I hit the O key, bring up my, open my viewport properties, and da -da -da, it's under the active meshes section. And ultimately what we're choosing to enable and disable is this wireframe overlay. When it's colored, you can see that they're on. And then when it's set to none, they go off. Okay? Yes, sir. Well, like, I have a question. Like, you know how it looks like the object looks gray right now? Sometimes when I load my file, it shows like, it seems like there's like a light. There's like a light. Yeah. And, like a shadow casting. Yeah, and chances are you're actually seeing the light and a preview of the lighting engine itself. We're actually going to talk about that a little bit today. But, but how do you take it off? Yeah. So if you go back into your viewport properties, oops, excuse me. Under the visibility section, show lights. See how you can start to see the shadows underneath when I turn it on? I often, whenever I'm, whenever I'm modeling, okay, I often turn off the visibility of my lights because sometimes they just get in the way, right? Sometimes it just gets in the way. It kind of occludes the wireframes or sometimes it makes it really difficult for me to see the verts on my mesh, okay? I turn it off. I turn it off when I'm modeling. It becomes a critical, very important part of our, uh, our lighting setup. All right. So today I wanted to spend some time talking about textures, and we're also going to explore lighting a little bit. Because really, at the end of the day, the model is only about half of the work, right? It's an important percentage of the overall product itself. But again, it's only about half of what the audience sees. The fastest way to ruin, and I mean ruin, 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 a good model is to slap some bad textures on it, right? You could have the best model on the face of the planet. You put a horrible texture on it. Believe it or not, people, are, people always judge a book by its cover. And all they're going to see is the bad textures, right? Which is unfortunate, but that's just kind of the way we work, OK? Um, so I think it's a, it's a good practice to look at how we can create some good textures. And there's some good material setups and some good tiny texture uh, techniques that I want to show you guys that's going to amplify your, your quality and the results that you're going to get. Now, hopefully, everyone has that little birdhouse. I'm going to work on this. And this, these exact same ideas can and should be applied to your little birdhouse. So if you, if you need and want something to practice with and practice on, your little birdhouse that you just made is going to be a good little assignment to do. All right. So first things first, I'm going to turn off the visibility of my lights. Yep, things are looking good. All right. So now that I have the model done, what's the first thing I'm going to need to do in order to put some textures on here? We've got to create materials, right? What's the magic keyboard shortcut that allows us to do that? M. The M key. So this is really the first thing that I do. And here's a great little tip, because one thing that when you're working on complex objects, project a little bit into the future. For your homework this week, you're going to be working on materials and textures for a pretty complex shape. So here's a great little trick that I've learned over the years. Color code things. Okay? Let me show you what I'm talking about. I know that I want to have probably this similar texture for both the, for both the roofs here. Okay? Uh, understanding which polygons have been assigned to which material group can be a challenge at times. Okay? We're going to have six or seven material groups all at play inside of my scene here, at least. Okay? So let me just start this process. This is going to be the roof. And check it out. I want to make my color coding system very bright and very vibrant. We're never, ever, ever going to see the diffuse color because we're going to put a two-dimensional texture map on top of this material group. So the diffuse color value really ultimately, in this particular instance, doesn't matter. right? I'm going to color code it. And I want to use my little, my little crayons here. I love my little crayons. This, this, is, this is such a cup holder feature on the Mac OS, right? It's an unneeded feature, but it just makes me feel good, right? It brings me back to kinder, kindergarten. I want to have my roofs be strawberry. Why not? Although I don't think that looks like strawberry. That's a pink, but whatever. Okay. 
That's pink to me. So now what I'm looking for here is other things that need to share this exact same material group. So that's going to be the roof in there. Okay, cool. Let's do, let's do the wood beams. Yeah, go ahead. Did I miss one? Yeah. Where did I miss? Oh, I can put, you know, I'll save this one for a different, because that's probably going to be like a metal. You know, the, the little flue covering for a chimney, that's more likely to be a metal than like a wood shake or a, or a shingle of some kind. Because then, then your roof would catch on fire. <laughs> then, generally speaking, that's bad when your roof catches on fire. Okay, anyways, so check it out. This is really a helpful idea when we're working with a lot of, a whole bunch of individual pieces. It allows you to very quickly see which parts have been tagged and which parts haven't been tagged. This is going to be wood, new material, wood beams. And let's give it a bright color-coded thing. Let's just make it a bright aqua. Why not? So now, when I'm looking around my mesh, here we go. These are going to be... Oops. Yeah, I missed some. Yep, and that's okay. I'm going to come back. I'm just throwing some down. I can't spell chimney. There we go. And I'll make this one, I don't know, how about a lovely shade of tangerine? There we go. So the whole purpose here is to start color coding. When you use these bright, vibrant colors, it's really easy to see the visual connection between the polygons and the material groups. Okay, Because I want all the, the walls to share the same material group. Okay, like that's going to be a material, this one in here. So let's go find plaster walls. There we go. It's a great way to see if you've missed something because you don't want to miss anything. It goes pretty fast. There it is. Okay. Oops, I missed one over here. This is all supposed to be plaster. All of this stuff down here. I want this to be a different. This is going to be stone walls. How about turquoise? All right. And now we can start visualizing, just with simple colors, the association, the relationship between all the polygons and, the, and their connected material groups. All the green ones are the exact same material group. All the pink ones are the exact same material groups. We're not relying exclusively on the contents of the shader tree to help us understand how our shader tree is constructed. Okay? And it helps it go, you know, it just makes it go a whole lot faster as well. Now, when you're working with complex objects, believe it or not, selecting a lot of little pieces can be a pain in the butt. It really can. Sometimes we have to be uh, kind of super ninjas when it comes to our selection process. I want to very quickly go in and um, assign probably that wood beam material group to all the wooden planks at once. I don't want to have to sit there and click on every single one. That's going to drive me crazy, right? It's a waste of my time. There are better ways of getting to that selection than individually selecting each polygon on the mesh itself because I got a whole bunch of these things that I want to click on, okay? Now, we've been looking at our different selection sets over the past uh, couple months. And of course, we can go and select vertices, edges, and polygons. But did anyone discover what this one is? Item. It's actually not item. If you look very carefully, the item selection set, set is in there. If you pull down, is yours is set to item. So. Yeah, this is materials. If nothing is turned on, if none of these, and you may be in an older version of Moto, by the way. Um, if none of these are selected, you're in item mode, okay? But if this one is selected, this is material selection, okay? Because now I can go, think, go in and select components by their material tag. See how when I hover over an object with material, you get that kind of boundary highlight? So I just selected all the polygons that have been associated with the roof material, okay? I can go in, I'm going to hold down the shift key, I'm going to add in the green ones as well. I'm going to convert my material selection over into a polygonal selection. You can do that by holding down the option key. See how it changes? 
is now we're converting from one selection state into another selection state. Now I'm going to convert my material selections into my polygons. Ta-da! So now I have all the roof polygons and all of the plaster wall polygons selected at once. Maybe I just do H to hide them. Okay, oops, looks like I forgot. This one's supposed to be plaster wall on here. I can hide them. Now the chimney is pretty easy. All this jazz. Just hide those polygons. And what I'm trying to do here is expose just the polygons that I, I want to use. There we go, for my wood beams. Because that's, oops, that's supposed to be plaster wall. Because there they all are. They're all, well, I'll forget it. Yeah, okay. I can't stop being me. There we go. All right. <laughs> uh, ah, there's a hidden one in there. I don't know how that one actually may be an error. So I'll assign it to that group just as well. All right. There we go. Now it looks like I have just all the wooden beams left. And I got there very quickly by you know, selecting a material, converting it into polygons, and then it basically leaving the things that I want to group together. Now I'm just going to hold on the middle mouse button, drag out a big box, hit the M key, find my wood beams group. Done. Okay. I'm not going to sit here and select each individual one. That's a monumental waste of my time, and that gives me that makes me grumpy. And I don't like being grumpy. I like being happy. Let's unhide the rest of the model. And now we can very clearly see by these really extreme colors the, vi the, the, the visual relationship between all the different material groups that are active inside of my scene itself. It's really easy. Yeah? How do you unhide things again? What's the keyboard shortcut to unhide polygons? Mm -hmm. U. U. U for unhide. Okay? H for hide. Shift H to hide the unselected polygons. Mm -hmm. And then U to unhide. All right, so I got one more material group that I need to establish. This is just going to be, let's just call it metal. I don't know what kind of metal this is going to be. And I'll make it uh, honeydew. Why not? Ta -da! There it is. Say again? It does. It does. And that's okay. I'm just trying to visualize the relationship between all the polygons and their connected material group. I want them, now I can see if there's any sort of error, if I messed up somewhere, okay? Um, and that every single polygon has been associated with its own dedicated material group. Because we don't want to have anything uh, unlinked to a material group. All the polygons need to be assigned to their own material, or a material, let's put it that way. Not necessarily their own, but a material inside the scene. All right. So this is looking, this is looking fantastic. By the way, I would live in a house like this. This kind of reminds of, it reminds of, of like the up house, right? Just super brightly colored. Say again. Yeah, I like bright colors. I'm a color guy, you know. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think you know, we are currently in this uh, this next gen look. Okay. Uh, and everything next gen is like desaturated. It's like shades of gray and brown. And I don't want to live in a world that's just full of shades of br uh, gray and brown. I like color. I like, I like a lot of color, actually. So I think this is a whole lot of fun. Ta-da! Keep it, right? Print it, put it on the wall. No, I'm joking. I'm not going to put it on the wall. That kind of maybe is a little, a little too brightly colored. But now that we have it established, we can start making some, some meaningful connections over in the shader tree to start you know, kind of filling in and replacing these really bright, vibrant colors with some meaningful textures. Okay? Now, earlier in the semester, we, start, we started talking about the awesomeness of textures.com. And you guys have been using textures.com. It's a great, great resource, right? Uh, I hope that you continue to use textures.com going forward. It's not the only place on the web that has uh, textures made for our industry, but it's a good starting point. So I definitely, definitely recommend that you continue to go there. Let's visit this, the website real fast, because I need to download some textures. There we go. Oh, look, they got some new stuff in here. This is fun. 
Okay. I want to choose not to share my login credentials with you guys. Haha. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. Ta da! All right. So let's go find some good textures that, we'll, that we can work uh, that we can work with inside uh, of our little house. Now, I think it's important that we understand the intent behind this, what we're trying to achieve. I think I'm definitely going to want to find some really great textures for the roof, maybe a cool plaster wall texture for the side. And I think we'll also do some wood beams and maybe a stone wall pattern for the foundation of my little kind of like old English style house. Okay. So I'm, I think I'm going to start with maybe four or five textures really quickly. Let's go ahead and find them. This is my favorite part, by the way. I really miss the vertical nav bar. Uh, so let's do, let's just start with the plaster walls. All right. Ooh. Mmm. I love painting my models. This is my favorite part because this is when everything starts to come to life a little bit, right? So I, I apologize if I start to go shopping here. Ooh, what's this? Let's, uh, let's do bear. Let's see what's in the bear one. And I'm going to filter what's showing up on textures.com by only visualizing the seamless textures only. Because those are the ones that I want to work with. I want to work with just the textures that are going to tile over and over and over again. And there's a lot of really great ones in here. Ooh. Ah. I'm going to get this one at the top. This is going to be my jam. Yep, this is it. This is the winner. Uh, let's download this one again. And let's start throwing it in. I think it's a good practice to put them in the model the moment that you download them. You're going to get confused if you don't, because oftentimes the naming conventions uh, are kind of odd for the files that come off the web. So let's get it in here. Uh, walk me through the process of importing this texture onto the plaster walls material group here in Moda. How do I do it? So here's plaster. OK, and then what was it? Add layer, yep. Image map. Yep. And which one of these? Yep, load image. Some people get confused. They think it's going to be new image. This is going to create a blank image, an empty image. Moto has a really great painting engine, one that I think we're going to begin to explore next week. We can paint our own texture maps on the models, which is pretty neat. We're going to do a pumpkin next week. It's Halloween next Wednesday, so we're going to make our own pumpkin. It's going to be pretty cool. We're going to talk about sculpting tools and the painting tools a little bit next week. Should be pretty fun. Uh, but for today, we're going to load in an image, an existing image, and navigate to where we saved it on my desktop. And right now, it's in my downloads folder. Whoa, look at all this stuff. There it is. All right. So my lovely diffuse color of lime green has been replaced almost instantaneously with that plaster texture. It's in there, OK? But, and I'm going to go back into my model view. There's a couple things in here that we need to look at. First and foremost, it's very difficult to see the image itself. And it's also getting incredibly washed out in the final render. If you go back to what the preview render engine is giving us, I mean, check this action out. Yeah, it's just almost kind of visualizing as gray. That's a problem for us, OK? We need to change it. Remember, what we see is what we get, OK? The preview render window does a great, great job of showcasing exactly how the texture is most likely going to show up. So the color space of the image is, needs to be adjusted. I really like the texture itself, or the texture qualities of the photograph. Um, but I need to adjust how the image is actually integrated into the render environment to get the result that I'm after. This isn't a throwaway. Sometimes people see this and they just throw it away. Oh, it doesn't work, right? No, it works. We just need to make some changes to it, OK? So let's start making some changes to the image to get what we're after. First and foremost, let's uh, adjust the pattern a little bit. We get a little bit of a goof up here. We can see the repeating texture at the kind of the peak of my roof line. I want to try my best to avoid that. And oof, look at that. Ooh, don't know if I like that. Okay. So now that I need to make some adjustments to how the image is showing up on the polygons, where do I go to make these adjustments? Does anyone remember? 
Not so much the, it's the locator, the texture locator. Yeah, the texture locator. The texture locator is fundamentally responsible. Its sole purpose is to figure out how to place this image on our three-dimensional shapes. That's its only role inside the shader, the shader system. So let's jump over to our shader tree for a moment. And there's a couple different ways that we can get access quickly to this texture locator. Now, if you have the texture selected, as I have it here, downstairs in the properties panel, of course, we have a couple tabs. Since I have the texture selected, the texture layers property is something that we're going to see most likely first. And then underneath it, it's going to be the texture locator. Okay? One other way that we can get access to our texture locator is to click on this little plus sign, and there it is. That's the actual physical texture locator itself. With it individually selected, you can see that we're not getting any of that texture layers properties that we saw just before, and we're filtering the properties menu by the selection inside the item list. All right, so right now, this projection type is determining how this image is being projected onto the actual polygons itself. Now, I think at the beginning of the semester, we talked a little bit about this, and the whole idea is actually not too dissimilar from a standard cinema projector. It's actually almost identical in theory, okay? If you think about it, these projectors, they're taking an image, and they're blasting it, if you will. They're shining a light through an image, and that image is being amplified and magnified by the lens, okay? And it's, you know, getting real large on the screen itself, okay? Uh, we're doing something very similar in our world. We have a projector, and that projector is, you know, you know, blasting an image onto a surface, onto a face, okay? Now, the projection type determines, it's kind of like a rule, if you will. It determines how this image is going to get wrapped around the faces. The default projection type is UV map, and we haven't even talked about UV maps yet. And that's actually, it's a pretty difficult conversation, one that we're going to go into very, very deeply in 424, the class that you guys are going to take next semester, okay? We actually do a tremendous deep dive into UV mapping because it's a required component for the real-time rendering architecture. It's something that we can live without here in an offline rendering world, like Moto or an Arnold or in Renderman. We don't need them. But if you're working in a real-time rendering engine, you have to have them. So we have a really intense conversation about UV maps in that class. For today, however, we need to walk away from the UV map projection type and maybe explore some of the, the other pro, uh, possibilities in here. Okay? So we need to basically try to find a projection type that generally matches the shape of whatever it is that we're projecting, projecting the image onto. Now, what basic shape are the walls of my, my little house? Yeah, they're kind of squarish, so cubic, right? They're definitely not a sphere, definitely not a cylinder. So that automatically filters the list down into a couple, you know, natural options. Oops, sorry. Planar and cubic, okay? Well, my guys are pretty, pretty rectangular, pretty cubic, so let's see what happens when I change the projection type to cubic. So now we're no longer using the UV maps to generate the, uh, the placement of the image on the polygons itself. We're using this general rule. And of course, the pattern is going to change almost immediately. And generally speaking, I'm liking what I see here. This is working. But I definitely don't like this repeating pattern showing up right in the middle, uh, right in here. So I, wanna, I need to adjust the texture locator a little bit to very quickly get the result that I'm after. Now, when we were working in our lighthouse lab, what was my suggestion on how to adjust the texture locator so it kind of worked in the context of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the model? The size channels. You got it. Over here. So I got my texture locator selected. And the size channels and the position and rotation actually determine how the image is going to be placed on your, on your object. At times, this can, be, uh, this can be a moment of frustration. It really can. It, I mean, I remember when I first started, I, I just pull my hair out. This is one of those moments where I want to just take my keyboard and bang it over my head, right? Because it's just like, what size values do I need? What rotation value? How is this even working? I don't know, right? It, abs it just feels like a completely stupid moment, right? Let me make it better for you guys, OK? And I remember mentioning to you guys, auto size. 
That's a great place to begin. Auto size really is a good place to begin. But let me show you a different way, okay? A different way that's going to give you a little bit more feedback and I think a little bit more control on how these images are showing up on the models itself. I'm going to change one thing, okay? I'm going to go back into my, my default viewport, hit the O key to bring up my viewport properties. If you look at the top here, we have a list of things that we can turn on and off. One of which is show texture locators. If we enable this option, we're going to get some weird abstract shapes that start to show up at the origin of the scene. What is that white box? It's the texture locator. Have you ever wondered why you have a whole bunch of cubes and spheres and cylinders just kind of sitting at the, the origin of your scene? Believe it or not, those are texture locators for images that are in your shader tree. Okay? Uh, and not only are they a visualization of the texture locator, they're also visualizing the projection type that the texture locator is currently tagged to. What shape is this? It's a cube, so we're using the cubic projection type for this image. Okay? Now, this is more than just a visualization. They're actually interactive. We can select them. We can move them around, scale them, rotate them, do whatever we want. Right? The only thing that we need to do in order to select our texture locators in the viewport is ensure that we are in item mode. Now, right now, I'm in a component selection state. But if I deselect my vertices selection state, I'm now in item mode. Okay. And the, the whole convention behind it is that you're either in an item mode or you're in a you know, component selection state. And if you just turn it off, you know, now you're in item mode. It's a little strange. I really am not a huge fan of this, but I can't control it, right? Um, so now that we're in item mode, I can go in and I can select that texture locator. I just clicked on its boundary and I got it selected now. Now if I hit the Y key, which is the item transform tool, okay, different than just the regular move, W, E, and R, the move, rotate, and scale tools, the Y key fires off item transform. And now I can move and scale and rotate this shape this texture locator wherever I want. Now look what happens when I start to move my texture around inside the scene. You can actually start to see it interactively updating on the mesh itself. Can you guys see that? I know it's kind of hard to see. See how the texture is moving? Yeah. Yay! This is a whole lot better than dealing with those channels over in the texture locator channel boxes, right? Because now I can just scale it up. I can move it down. Maybe I need to scale it disproportionately along the y-axis okay, to get the result that I'm after. Yeah, generally speaking, I got some, some things in here that I need to, need to fix, but I can fix those later. These texture locators are interactive. We can select them. We can move and rotate them and continue to position them inside of our scene to give us the, uh, the level of control that we're after. We can even rotate them. Mm -hmm. It's kind of fun. It's kind of trippy sometimes when you rotate them around, along an axis that doesn't really do anything. So what this allows us to do is just to iterate very quickly. Yeah. How can you set center to rotate? What do you mean center? Center to what? That's because because center selected over here is only for components. Now, if you wanted to center your, your uh, texture locator back, all you need to do, I'm going to select it here real fast. Here we go. All you need to do, see whenever I move and scale a lo an item, it retains all of that transformations. Okay. If you wanted to uh, get it back to the center, just put 0, 0, 0. Now it's back at the origin. Okay. If you wanted it back to its original size, well, this is this is a texture locator, so we're not doing uh, we're doing distances, and I don't remember what the distance is off the top of my head. What the default distance is? Uh, it's not 100 percent. That's what, it's not working with a within a zero to 100 you know scale, um, but you could start to make these at the very least uniform and get them back to something that you had before. Interesting. And, um, I guess I don't know how I got into that situation, but I knew the center, so there's no um, way to 
Well, that's what you're doing. This is all world coordinates. This is world XYZ, world rotation XYZ. Yeah. So I don't, I don't, I don't know what, uh, what your scene was producing, but yeah. OK. All right. Um, personally, I think this is a really fantastic way of very quickly placing your textures on the model. OK? Because uh, you know, having to deal with this, this is just a nightmare for me. OK. Let's keep cruising. So I want to make mine just a little bit bigger. Let's see where it needs to be. And it's still actually maybe too small. I'm trying to get rid of that really odd. Yeah, there we go. That's good enough. All right, so I'm really happy with that. I'm liking how that texture is showing up across uh, my entire image. So part one is solved, right? The placement of the textures. The other problem that we, uh, that we were running into a second ago was it getting washed out. Okay, It's really not as bright and vibrant as the original image. So we need to go in and make some adjustments to the actual image itself to pop the colors a little bit, to make them a little bit more saturated, and to really take advantage of the color space of the texture inside the context of what the render, the render engine is going to produce. Okay. So this next bit, I'm going to leave the preview window open and running. This next bit oh, you know, kind of forces us to say goodbye to the texture locator for the time being, and then actually go to the image itself, the texture layers section of the shader tree properties. Okay. Because now we can start to control how this image is physically going to be reproduced in the render itself. Okay? Think of this like a very, very basic version of Photoshop. Okay? It allows us to do some very basic levels calls, if you will, to adjust the brightness and the contrast. We can do this on the actual textures themselves to ensure that what we're, what we're seeing in the render is, is really what we're after. Ultimately, where we're going down here, oops, excuse me, went a little too far. If you start to look at this, we have some really great controls. We can even do blending of different textures. And if you're used to working over in any sort of image editing application like Photoshop, changing the blend modes of all these layers can produce some really powerful effects. We can do the exact same thing here in Moto, which is pretty exciting. Okay? Uh, I think what I want to focus on is the brightness and the contrast down here. Okay? The brightness and the contrast oftentimes probably should be adjusted to really ensure that the image is, per, is, uh, is coming out uh, the way we want it to come out. Okay? So let's look at what happens when I start maybe just increasing the contrast a little bit. Yeah, now some of those details are starting to pop, which is pretty neat. Really had to, let's really drive it. There we go. That's actually a whole lot better. I like that, personally. At 206, don't be, well, you know, I think a lot of folks, they get to 100% on a lot of these sliders. And they go, oh, I need to stop. No. no just keep going. <laughs> just keep going, right? Uh, so the contrast is something that we absolutely, almost always need to begin to adjust. Um, in addition, sometimes the brightness, I'm overblowing it very intentionally here. But small little changes to, that's really cool. Let's put that at 94. Yeah. Now all those lovely little details that were in the image are starting to pop out a little bit more. Okay? I'm liking that. Another thing that you could look to, to, to adjust, and this is going to take some, uh, some experimentation, is the gamma. Okay? So if I put this to like 1.8, it gets a little bit brighter. Okay? Uh, let's put this. I want to reset my brightness and contrast. There we go. Yep, I went the wrong way. Let's go 0.4 on my gamma. Too far. Let's do point, not point point eight. Let's do point 0.9. Sometimes making small adjustments to your gamma can also start. You know, the gamma is basically kind of like the midpoint, if you will, in your in your histogram. Sometimes these small little micro movements in your gamma can give you a really good result. I think I liked what I had earlier with a really intense, super contrasty. Yeah, look at that. That's pretty sweet. 
I think I had my brightness at 94%, and I'm going to call that one, that one pretty done. Okay. Let's do a comparison render here real fast, because I think it's really important to see what happens when we make color adjustments in, uh, in the renderer versus not doing it, just by relying on, on what the image actually is. There's a lot of color information from these textures. Okay? Sometimes it gets washed out in the renderer. I always like to think of the renderer kind of like a camera. Um, I remember watching a, a, a behind the scenes video on The Hobbit. And um, there's, a, there's a, I forget which one it's in. I think it's the number two in Markwood, where they had that great sequence with all the spiders. Yeah. yeah. And um, this particular video, they were, they were filming that whole sequence in Merkwood, and I remember looking at the environment, and I went, whoa, those trees are like practically red, right? And I remember thinking, and I was like, why are they, this, these don't look real at all, right? But they're, 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 the trees were red in the video, and then a couple minutes later, as if the, 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 the filmmakers were reading my mind, they interviewed one of the cinematographers, and said, oh yeah, the cameras that we're using, they just eat up all the red. So we have to make all of our set pieces a little bit redder than they actually are, because our camera is going to interpret that red different than how our eyeballs interpret it, okay? Our rendering engine is kind of like that, right? We have to bend our images to make it work within the render. Okay? These small little adjustments actually do a great, great job. Okay, so here's what the adjustments on. And let's put them back to their defaults. 100% contrast, 100% that, and I'll put the gamma back to 1. Let's render again. And this is all, of course, to taste. This is just my interpretation of it, too. The cool thing about this flexible work environment is that you get to imp you impose your own impression of what this, this, uh, this texture is going to look like. The bigger and the larger point here is that you have control over it, right? That there is no magic going on behind the scenes. You're actually more in more control than you think you are when it comes to the creation of your, uh, of your final render. All right. So, so here's the actual... I'm looking at it at 100%, so pixel per pix pixel recreation of the render. Here's the raw image mapped onto the, onto the outside of my house, okay? And here's the corrected one. That's a pretty stark difference, okay? This one's all gray, desaturated. You don't see any of that lovely color information, but a small adjustment to the brightness and the contrast is producing something that looks pretty damn good, in my opinion. I'm pretty pleased with this. I'm going to move on. Right, I'm going to move on. All right. So let's do one more because I'm running out of time here. And I, for that, I honestly apologize. Let's go back. I believe there's a section. Here we go. Roofing. All right. That's what I'm talking about. Now, I think I want to break my roof into maybe two different materials. Uh, material group for the underside and then a material group for the, for the outside, okay? Because we we're creating an illusion here. Often when you're working with Italian textures, it just kind of looks like you wallpaper things with Italian texture. We want to break that illusion as much as we can, right? Uh, so we're going to add a couple layers of detail in here. Let's do, let's just do something simple. Let's do just a wood, simple wood roof. Ooh, this is fun. Done. Okay, I'm also going to go back two pages here. Let's do roofing inside. And let's see, I'll just use this one. This one looks like fun. All right, and let's get those inside the scene itself. First things first, let's just put my roof texture in my roof image or my roof material group. There it is. Okay, looking not awesome at all, right? What are you talking about? Like, so cool. Done. <laughs> right? Those are some gigantic roofing tiles, right? But we can make it better, right? And a small little adjustment to the size of our texture locators is, is going to get us where we need to go. So let's just change the projection type. I'm going to try cubic, see what that gets me. 
Yeah, that's actually not so bad. I'm going to leave it at that current size just because I need to move on a little bit. But we can make some adjustments to it. Uh, in addition, I'm also going to change its, uh, its texture layer properties just a little bit. Let's make it more contrasty. I'm going to reduce the brightness just a little bit too. Yeah. Whenever you're working with images, you need to have some very, very dark pixels next to some very, very light pixels. When everything is kind of in the middle, when everything is in those gray tones, believe it or not, it all washes out. It all looks like it just kind of blends together. By increasing the contrast of our images, we're pushing the dark pixels to the darkest part of our color spectrum and the lighter pixels to the brighter parts of our color spectrum. Uh, so we're increasing the, the range of colors okay, that are now available for the renderer to produce. And this is starting to look a lot better, right? I like that. Yay! This is good. Okay. However, the illusion is not good at all, right? I think on the roof here, it gives us such a great illustration of one of the big challenges as 3D artists that we run into, this wallpapering effect, okay? It just looks like we've gone back to like 1992, okay, when it comes to computer graphics, right? We're just, just everything has been wallpapered with a common tiny texture. We're not producing the level of realism that we're after here. So by breaking it into logical chunks, it, you know, the illusion can be heightened pretty directly, okay? So here's an idea, something that we can do to heighten the illusion and to make this look a little bit more realistic, okay? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to make another material group for the undersides of my roof. Because I don't want to, obviously, I don't want to see the roofing tiles underneath the roof. That's going to break the illusion incredibly fast. There we go. Hit the M key. I'll call this roof underside. There we go. That's already looking better. Okay. Now, if we were to open up our preview render again, okay, that's better, right? Already visually, that's a whole lot stronger than what it had before, right? We're not breaking this reality, but we can do it a little, a little bit better, right? Maybe we, it's time for us to go in and start assigning some custom materials to the boundaries, to this in here, because we wouldn't have the roofing tiles wrapping around the edge and coming down the front of the roof, right? The roofing tiles should only be on the top facing polygons. We should only see the roof here, you know, over here. These polygons should be something else, maybe like a cool like wood beam texture or some sort of painted wood. That could be something neat. So I want to make another texture to help me round out the illusion a little bit. Believe it or not, the path to a very successful render comes from these small little micro details. On the surface, you're probably thinking, eh, no one's ever going to see. Guess what? The one thing you can't control is your audience's subconscious. They see more than, the, than you think they see. So we've got to ensure that the, these little details are taken care of. Yeah. Oftentimes they're stupid reasons. Okay. So, yeah, because you know what? People, people need to go outside sometimes and do something other than play video games for 20 hours a day, right? I saw the best meme a while ago. It's been around the internet for a long, long time. It's a guy sitting in front, uh, a guy with like a headset on, like the old school classic gamer headsets. And he's got his mouse and his keyboard, and he's looking out his window, like as if he's, and then the, the meme says, worst game ever, right? <laughs> yeah. Reality. Some people are just, you can't, some people are impossible to please. All right, so this is starting to look good. I'm happy with it. Let's go ahead and put some of those extra images into it. I downloaded a, that's the plaster. That's the cool tiles. Ah, here we go. That's what I'm after. And it's in moments like these that I'm really, really thankful for the texture locators that we have, because uh, I really need to do some big time adjustments.
Okay. If you're ever if you're ever wondering which texture locator you're selecting, look down here in the bottom right hand corner of your OpenGL viewport. It's telling you precisely which texture locator that you've created. So it's textures com plaster bear. So this is the wrong one. Okay. I want to find the uh, the texture locator that says uh, oh, what is it? I forgot the name of it. It is not that one. Oh, I forgot to change my texture locator from. Uh, I have multiple things selected. Excuse me. I don't want UV map. I want. Let's do. Let's do solid or uh, cubic again. There we go. And if you're still, oh, it's in the center. Sometimes these texture locators can be a little bit difficult to see. It's just a thin, small, there it is. It's just a thin, very small, uh, oops, wrong one. There we go. You can also select it. There it is. You can also select it. Sometimes that's the easiest thing to do over here in your shader tree if you're not able to interactively select it uh, in the viewport. Now, I'm paying close attention to where this beam is on the image itself. You can get some freebies in here if you pay attention. Like that, look right here. Okay, There should be a beam right there on the underside of the roof to support the roof itself. We can get kind of freebies if we'd like, especially on these leading edges where we know our audience is going to see it. Right? If we're careful, and uh, put our texture locators in a spot that helps create the illusion, like right there. Look at that. It's a freebie little detail that I didn't have to model. Okay, and it's all coming from the image itself, that little beam there. And I get lucky. Uh, it's close enough for what we're doing today. The illusion generally continues around the outside of the edge, and I'm okay with that. Right? So that's starting to look pretty good. Let's get these, uh, the last one in. Now we need another texture for our wood edges. And I think I'm just going to travel over to the wood section real fast. And let's go into, ooh, reinforced is, is speaking to me. But I know this isn't what, because we don't need like these little metal studs and stuff on there. Although it is very cool looking, look at that. I miss like wooden doors. Does anyone else miss wooden doors? Like real wooden doors? The, the big solid ones? Nothing in our world is wooden anymore. I miss that. Everything is metal or some sort of like fiberglass or composite. Nice. All right, this is a good one. I'm going to download this one real fast. And I'll throw it into. Throw it into Moto, into that material group, and uh, get to work. Is this for your beams? This is for my beams, yep. Okay. All right, so this is where it turns into a little bit of a disaster for us, right? Because now we have uh, a whole bunch of weird angles, okay? Of course, the projection type is not what we want. Let's put it back to uh, cubic, okay? And Cubic is doing a pretty great job. So far, so good. Let's select my, my come on, select my texture locator. And let's see what I need to do here. And this is the kind of the big time benefit of having some of these texture locators visualized in the scene itself. Because we can actually kind of, what I'm looking at here is I'm looking at this edge of my texture locator in relationship to that beam. Okay, I'm just trying to eyeball it, trying to get it close so, the, so that the wood grain is generally going in the direction that I want it to go. Okay. However, is that going to work all over the place? No. Okay. Check it out. It's working here really well, but not so hot on this side, right? We can do it separately. Okay. And that's really the answer to this small little problem. And it kind of speaks to the larger theme of these tiny textures, is that success is in the details. Okay? You just can't assume, oh, my God, they're never going to see it in the render. Guess what? They're going to see it. And they're going to say, 
hey, the grain pattern is wrong. They may not be able to tell you why it's wrong or what's wrong about it, but they're going to reject the realism of the image because they know subconsciously that it's not right. Okay? So the solution to this problem is just to create another material right, with the exact same image whose texture locator is going in the opposite direction. Okay? All right, so I'm going to retarget, and I'm just going to do this one over here. Uh, so we'll call this uh, wood edges on the right side. Why not? Okay. However, this time I'm not going to load in another image, right? I want to use an existing image inside of Modo. So image map, but check it out. We have this clip browser. These are all the images that are currently in, uh, uh, in Modo, and this is the one that I want to use. Okay. It now has a new texture locator associated with it, so I'm free to move it wherever I want. Okay. I'm just going to select it real fast. Oops, excuse me, don't have it selected. There we go, now I got it selected. No, I don't. Ah! Oh, I don't want my house. Sometimes, believe it or not, oh, I didn't change my projection type. That's why I wasn't. It's the end of the day. I've been doing this far too long today. There we go, and that's looking pretty good. Okay, I want to turn off the visibility of my texture locators because at times they just get in the way. And I do the exact same thing for all of these. You know, I try to find the beams that are generally running in the exact same orientation inside of our 3D space and put them all in their own material group, get some their own texture locator, and then we can change the orientation of the texture locator to match the orientation of the beam. It's just a really fast way of getting us where we want to go. Let's look at preview real fast. Yeah, let's make some adjustments to the actual images themselves. Yeah, now the color is starting to come out. It's amazing how much that color gets just sucked away by the motor rendering engine. This is a brown texture. Let's make it a little bit darker. Yeah, that's better. That's better. The scale of my grain is a little wrong, but at least it's a step in the right direction. Okay. All right. So this little illusion that we're creating here is beginning to take shape a little bit. We can add a couple new layers into this illusion to give us uh, a more robust illusion. Because I think the roofing tiles are probably a really great example of this. They look still pretty flat. They don't look like they have any sort of dimension in there, right? They don't have any sort of indication of, of peaks and valleys, of shadows and highlights. Okay. Uh, we want to add that in. We want to start amplifying the illusion to start to increase the kind of visual fidelity of the render. So what we're, what we're going to add now is called a bump map, which allows us to very quickly create the illusions of peaks and valleys. Okay? Now we want these peaks and valleys to match the current pattern. right? We're not going to create a new image. We're going to recycle the image that's already on the roof. Okay? We're going to duplicate it. Okay? Check it out. This is pretty easy to make. Let me go find, I'm going to right click on the roof, select the image. It takes me immediately to it. It's one of my favorite features of the render, the preview window. Okay? Because what I want to do here, if you look carefully, this image is influencing the diffuse color value of these polygons. Okay? It's overwriting this lovely pink. Remember how I said about an hour ago that the pink really at the end of the day didn't matter because we're going to put an image on top of it? The material underneath is still pink. See? <laughs> still pink. But the texture is overwriting this channel. Okay? The texture is set to diffuse color, so it's basically eliminating this channel from being evaluated by the render engine. Okay. We're going to duplicate this texture and change its effect to start increasing that little illusion of peaks and valleys. It's really easy to do this. Check it out. Just right click on it, duplicate. Now I have two. The same, or, uh, the same texture locator, okay? Um, 
All the settings are, are identical, but this time on one of them, it doesn't matter which one, and it doesn't matter the order that it's in, we're going to change the effect from diffuse color, and it's way down here under surface shading, to bump. This is an old school trick. The bump effect goes all the way back to the early, early 80s. This is a camera trick. It really is. Where the camera sees uh, dark pixels on the image, it's going to create a shadow. Where it sees light pixels, it's going to create a highlight. And the illusion that we get is kind of surface relief. But it's just a camera trick. We're not actually adding or changing our geometry. We're creating the illusion of shadows and highlights exclusively at render. So this is only going to be seen once we hit that magic render button, right? It's a camera effect. Now, you may not see any immediate difference, OK? Because the bump effect is paired to the surface characteristics of our material itself. So this is determining the, uh, the brightness and the darkness, OK? But the, the height of our bump effect happens on the material itself. We find that down towards the bottom of our material reference section. And it's bump amplitude. Mine set to one, you know, point one nine inches. So it's pretty small. Let's increase this. And I, I really don't know the value off the top of my head. I'm just let's just put, I don't know. Let's put 10 inches in there. Why not? Whoa, a little too bumpy. Actually, that's not so bad. Yeah. It's subtle, but it is adding something there. Yeah, go ahead. You certainly could, yeah. The, this is a color image. Uh, to get the best bump effects, you'd actually want to make it a grayscale image, knock the contrast as high as you can, so you're only getting a black and white value for you know, the, the fronts of each tiles and then the grooves underneath. Yeah. Is that like what an alpha or something That's different. That's different. Alpha channel is determined transparency. This is where it is, where it's kind of creating a simple little camera effect. And I'm going to overdrive my bump amplitude. Let's put this to 20 inches. This is scene specific, so it's going to be different for each one of your little projects that you're working on. Uh, you know, even the shader effects, yeah, now it's really, really bumpy. Okay, let's do a simple render real fast. Let's see what we get. It takes a little bit longer to render because now that there's peaks and valleys, shadows and highlights, the environment and the reflections of our environment are having a much larger effect and role in the actual render themselves. I think you'll start to see the difference and the importance of this bump effect when I turn it off here in a second. When you're really far away from the object, when you're doing big objects like a house, um, bump effects pay huge dividends. We don't need to make displacement maps where we're physically moving geometry because you're never going to see the benefit of that from a distance. Bump effects give us a really great result. Let's do it one more time. This time I'm going to turn off my bump map and render again. That way we have a point of comparison. Yeah, it's subtle. But it is noticeable. You do pick up on it. So this is with it off. Mm -hmm. All right, there it is. I'm going to zoom into 100% magnification. Here's with it off, here's with it on. Off and on. It's a little bit more contrasty. We see some more shadows in there, which we should. We're also seeing some honest reflections of the environment, which is good. So it's starting to take on a little bit of life, OK? It's just a little bit of, you know, a little something something, as they say, OK? Um, all right. So add these small little bump effects to your renders. It will pay off. Sometimes in order to get a really good understanding of your bump effect itself, you got to overdrive this bump amplitude because it is scene specific and it's scale specific. Sometimes a lot of folks, they, they turn on the bump map and they go, 
I don't see any sort of visual difference, right? Put that to like two feet and then walk it back to what you think is appropriate. Go much further than you need and then find, kind of dial it in, okay? All right. I want to talk a little bit about lighting for the next, next minute or so, okay? Uh, because lighting has a big, big impact, especially on, uh, on architectural visualizations, okay? Uh, I think, let me see. Do I have, yeah, I have a shadow catcher. We've talked about shadow catchers before. There it is. Now I'm getting a lovely little ground shadow in there. But I want to start going in and crafting a lighting setup that's, uh, that's pretty accurate. Now, in this actual project file, I already have this lighting setup created. So bear with me just for one second while I, uh, while I nuke some stuff here. There we go. Uh, let's see. Okay, let me put my default directional light back in. There we go. There's our directional light. Da da. Excuse me for one minute. I forgot that on this particular one I had already set it up. Okay. So this is similar to what we're, what we're used to working with. We often, we have just that basic gray gradient. Here's a fast way of showcasing what our default lighting setup looks like. I'm going to create a new project file. And I want to take my rough model. This is a great trick, by the way. I want to take the model from one project file. So forge to, this is the project file I was just working in. I want to put it in another, just drag and drop it. I've combined them. You'll get a little popover that says, hey, what do you want to import? And I don't have any children items, but I do want all the shaders that I was just working with and all of their textures. Okay. Ta da. Did it grab the textures? Yep, sure did. Although someone, something's red. I like it. It's a lava roof. Gotta love lava. Let me fix the color real fast. It's the contrast. Let's put this back to 100. There we go. And the reason I'm having to adjust the contrast is in the previous previous file, I was not look using the sRGB lookup table, which made everything really kind of washed out. But I want to get it back to. Oops. It is, it is pretty, pretty rocking. 